questions if uh, we can follow up a few simple rules. Um, we have two microphones here, and uh, I would ask you that you come up to the microphones, and we'll take you one at a time. Um, we would limit your, your discussion to, to two minutes, and uh, please show respect for uh, our speaker tonight. And uh, if we do, I, that's my job is to make sure that uh, we keep within those limitations. But I think you're really enjoying the speech that we have tonight, and I'd like you to please give a warm welcome to Dr. Hamish Kimmins. Good evening, everyone. Uh, very happy to be here. Thanks for the introduction, Doug. Personally, to disappoint you, I'm afraid, as you know, all academics are their living by talking. My speeches can be a tad longer than 40 minutes. It was 40 minutes in the briefing notes, but I'm afraid it goes closer to an hour, a bit longer. So I hope I can keep you all awake. I know you've all had supper. <laughs> it's the end of the day, so I hope I can keep you all going. I'm very happy to be here. The last time I was in Nelson doing something remotely like this was about 18 years ago when I was giving a short course to uh, people in the Forest Service on forest ecology. The next closest thing was about 16 years ago when Ralph Moore, or one of the environmental groups at Crescent, got me down there to give a, uh, some presentations on forest ecology. And then John Woodworth of uh, Okanagan Snowflake Parks Association had me give a short course on forest ecology over in the Okanagan. Tonight I'm sponsored by Forest Industry. And personally, I think it's very interesting that this is the sponsorship now, not the Ministry of Forest, not environmentalist groups. Because I think it shows that there is a change, and so there should be, there is a change and the forest industry is very concerned to try to respond to uh, increasing change in public attitudes towards the environment, public uh, requirements or, or uh, things they would like to have from their forest environment. And I think it, it does go very well, and that is the sponsorship. Of course, there will be some people who feel this time that I'm talking from an industry point of view, just as someone might have thought I was speaking from an environmentalist point of view the last two times I did it. I'm no apologist for industry, I'm no apologist for any side. I'm here to speak about good forestry from a scientific point of view, from an academic point of view. And the industry forestry and ministry forestry must stand on their own merits and they must answer for what they're doing. I am here to talk about what I perceive to be some of the environmental aspects of forestry. I'm going to talk about clear cutting. Not because it's necessarily the most important issue in any particular case. I could have talked about herbicides or slash burning or some other aspect of forestry. But I decided to talk about clear cutting because in discussing clear cutting, I have to deal with a lot of the issues and things that need to be thought about as we address many of the different issues in forestry and the question of the forest environment debate. I'm not here to try to persuade you what you should think about clear cutting. I would like to suggest, however, how you might think about it. That in considering how we achieve the conservation we all want, how we improve the management of the world's forests and the forests around Nelson too, uh, as we strive to get those improvements, some of the questions that we have to ask ourselves and have to ask other people and get answers to those questions so that we can make the right choices that in fact will achieve conservation and improve forest management. We live in a democracy and in, in a democracy it is the ultimate, ultimately the will of the people that should influence how things are done. But democracy only works well when the choice is an informed choice. And when we go to the ballot box and when we make decisions and when we participate in decision-making organizations, we must be sufficiently familiar with the various aspects of the issues we're talking about so that we can contribute and achieve the, the goals that we have set ourselves. So that's my goal tonight, is to try to present to you a context within which questions like clear-cutting slash burning herbicides or any other aspect of management should be considered, and a variety of technical questions that I will not bore you with the infinite detail of, but just to go through some lists of questions that have to be addressed in reaching the answer to the question, is clear-cutting the appropriate 
or is it an inappropriate method of harvesting the timber component of our forests on any particular site in British Columbia? It turns out it's a very complex question and there are many things we have to think about. So if I could have the lights please and I'll proceed to my slide. I, I feel that way. I then want to talk about the two phases of conservation and the role of the environmental movement in achieving the change that we want. And I will be suggesting that there are two phases to conservation and we need to understand these two phases if we are to be effective in achieving that which we uh, desire. Then I'm going to go into the technical part which is an evaluation of the some ecological and other aspects of clear cutting, just a list of technical points that need to be considered. And I will terminate this somewhat long presentation with an, an urging uh, that we use ecologically based planning tools that I don't think we, we are using some, some very good ones, and they're having a very good effect, but there are some additional uh, ecologically based planning tools that I think should be used in forestry around the world and in BC. Before we start with the historical and global perspective, we need to be sure that we all are going to share a common image in our minds when we use particular words. And I want you to understand the way I am using the word clear-cutting. There are many conflicts in life that arise because we share the same words, but we do not share the same mental images. Uh, a single word elicits different thoughts in different people's minds many conflicts between countries, between spouses and other people in relationships come from the lack of communication because people interpret words or phrases different ways. So it's very important when we're talking about these things that we all understand the way in which a particular word is being used. So I'll start off with some definitions. Clear cutting is simply the removal of all the trees from an area. But that definition isn't enough because the removal of four trees from a patch of forest is the removal of all trees from that little area, but that's not a clear cut, not ecologically. So ecologically, it is the removal of all trees in a single cut from an area sufficiently large to remove the forest influence from the majority of the harvested area. If you look, please, at the first of these two diagrams, we have a forest here, and a forest has a microclimate. You walk through a forest in midsummer, and it's cool, there's not much wind, the air is moist perhaps and then you walk out into a large area without trees and it's hot it's much drier the air is much drier you're perspiring as you hike through the forest you're quite quickly dry as you walk across a clear area and the wind may be higher so there is a substantial modification of the microclimate around a forest and that microclimate extends out as a microclimatic shadow some distance from the forest into the area from which trees have been removed Similarly, below the ground, the roots of trees can spread substantial distances out into a, an area from which trees have been harvested, creating an underground shadow or forest influence. So a clear cut is an area from which trees have been removed large enough that most of the area no longer receives this forest influence. Down here, we have areas from which all the trees have been removed, but the forest influence extends far enough out that most of the area is occupied by the forest influence. That is not a, a clear cut, it's one of the other systems. And if we look at some of the other systems, we go all the way from clear cutting down here, where clearly most of the area no longer has a forest influence, to a seed tree method, where foresters leave individual trees scattered across the area to provide a seed source for natural regeneration, each of those extends a small area of microclimatic modification, but again, most of the area is still lacking such a modifying influence. So that is really a clear-cut method with some seed trees left. Shelterwood is where sufficient trees are left that the microclimatic modification of the individual trees, in fact, influences most of the area. There may be some diminution, some significant diminution or even complete absence over some of the area of that modifying influence, but most of the area has some modification. So that is not a clear-cut method. Patch cutting is where all the trees are removed from this small patch, but again, a minority of the area loses its forest influence. Smaller still, where we might remove only uh, four to 20 trees, a little patch cut, there is some diminution of forest influence in the middle of each patch, but essentially the forest influence is continuous. 
And finally, single tree selection. Individual trees are removed and there is essentially no significant diminution of the forest influence. What I am talking about here is clear cutting and I will be contrasting it at various times with various other non-clear cutting methods. So is it happening in British Columbia? Well, yes it is and, and it always has happened in various places. There's various places where it doesn't happen. Uh, here is an area over by Arrow Lakes and it, it is uh, an area of essentially seed tree. Individual trees are left. There's not really enough left to produce much microclimatic modification. So that's really a clear cut method. Here's a close up of a seed tree. Essentially the foreground is all free of trees. In the background we have, this is near Kamloops, a few large Douglas firs. They're wind firm because they've always stuck up above the canopy so they're used to being blown around in the wind. The smaller subordinate trees in here wouldn't be wind firm. If they were left, they would blow over. But individual Douglas fir trees that are wind firm left here as a source of seed, but not to specifically modify that environment below ground or above ground. Here, however, enough trees have been left to create a substantial microclimatic modification and below ground modification. You can see much of the forest still has essentially a forest microclimate. And here's what a shelter would look like from below, quite a lot of trees left on the site. So that is not a clear-cut method. Here from the air we see a shelter wood in the right-hand side here. And over here we see a group selection in which patches of perhaps 5, 10, 15 trees have been taken out. So this is a, one of the selection methods. Here is the shelter wood from the ground, substantial microclimatic modification, much of the below ground here occupied by these tree roots. And here is the group selection, uh, patches with relatively uh, less modified, uh, sorry, somewhat modified microclimates and patches here essentially a completely forest microclimate. Now there are some areas in British Columbia where clear cutting is completely inappropriate for reasons I'm going to be talking about. There are some areas, again I'll discuss the technical reasons later, where clear cutting should be done. It, it is the method of harvesting that should be done for, as I say, technical reasons I'll discuss, scientific and, and environmental reasons. There are a lot of areas where one has a choice. Sometimes, however, the choice is limited. For example, here was a case where removal from a selection cut, a group selection cut, resulted in about 30 or 40 percent of the trees being damaged. Many of these trees have now got rot and will uh, probably suffer uh, wind blow before the uh, crop is harvested again. If that cannot be avoided, then it may not be a suitable method. Again, in the stand uh, we saw from the helicopter there, many, many patches of dead trees from our malaria, a root rot, which gradually spreads out in concentric rings like the fairy rings of mushrooms on your front lawn, if you have them, killing Douglas fir and some other species as it goes. And if you try to practice selection harvesting or even very small group selection in a stand which is full of this particular pathogen and you're trying to grow Douglas fir, it will be very, very difficult. You'll probably lose a lot of trees to wind blow because the, the decay kills the roots and they lose their wind firmness and you'll finish up with a wind blown area that becomes a clear cut anyway. So some system other than individual tree or possibly even group selection would be appropriate because nature is limiting your choice in that environment even though for other reasons, climatic reasons, uh, you might not want to clear cut and uh, alternative non clear cut systems might be very appropriate. Here's another case where sometimes uh, selection type systems may be very difficult. This is in a very wet area, fairly high elevation and tremendously aggressive brush growth in here. So we're not getting natural regeneration because the understory has become so aggressive the trees can't seed in or will seed in exceptionally slowly. And in areas like that it may be very difficult to do the weed control. Uh, it may be not appropriate to use herbicides, mechanical site treatment may be difficult because of damage to the roots of the residual trees leading to root rots. And in cases like this it may be far more effective to harvest areas, small clear cuts uh, or larger patches so that one can deal with the competition. It's a very site specific situation but that is the case. Here's a case near the Salmo Crescent Highway where selection cutting has been done for uh, visual reasons but some very very heavy brush growth has resulted on this very rich and fertile site and significant problems 
in getting regeneration in here. There are ways of dealing with it, but it is very difficult. Then there are environments where nature takes over and really takes all your choices away. Here's a bark beetle outbreak in mature lodgepole pine. The entire area there is dead, and you simply can't go in and start practicing selection cutting in this kind of a stand. This is actually a fire kill stand, but it's much the same as a beetle kill stand where the beetles have killed all the trees. That doesn't always happen, of course, but where it does, the analogy is, is good. And for a start, Workman's Compensation Board wouldn't let you go in and do anything other than clear cutting in an environment like that. So yes, we are practicing uh, um, uh, alternatives to silviculture in many environments. There are some where clear cutting is totally inappropriate. Uh, there are areas where clear cutting is done and, and probably should be done, and there are areas where there are choices and perhaps we should be clear cutting, perhaps we shouldn't, and one can debate whether or not the correct choice has been made. So, having got a, aside the question of the definition, and yes, indeed, there is lots of alternative silviculture being done, now let's go on to the historical and global perspective. Clear cutting is probably as ancient as the human species has had the technology, axes and things like that, to cut down more than a few trees at a time. In other words, to make a big enough patch that they remove the forest influence. It's the way we harvest most of our food crops, too. And clear cutting is the uh, uh, predominant timber harvesting system used around the world. However, the history of public outrage and antagonism about clear cutting is not as ancient, but it is certainly very long. Ordinances were passed in Germany in the 12th and 13th centuries forbidding clear cutting on very steep mountain slopes where that clear cutting led to soil instability, avalanche, uh, cold air drainage that affected uh, agricultural things in the valleys, a uh, number of situations that that society found unacceptable. And still today, in parts of the European Alps, the Alps are largely limestone, they're incredibly oversteepened by recent glaciation, the soils are extremely unstable, and it is absolutely inappropriate to start removing forest cover over significant areas of those mountain slopes. And so in Austria, there is a, a law restricting clear cuts, well they're not clear cuts often, um, uh, forest harvest patches to one hectare. In most cases a hectare is not a clear cut because the forest influence is not lost over most of the area. Uh, often the, the harvest areas are much larger because of insects, disease, wind, snow damage, and various other natural agents, but where it is possible the foresters are uh, encouraged very strongly to keep the patches very small because of those environmental reasons. So that's a historical perspective on, on clear cutting. What about a historical perspective on forestry? Well, forestry is a human endeavor that has always been about conservation, and it's always been about attempting to satisfy society's demands for continuing supplies of a variety of values from their forested landscapes. Now, some of you may not think that that rings a bell with you, um, that, that sometimes forestry doesn't look like that but uh, the historical record from around the world shows that that's what happens, and let me explain that. Originally, when there's few people in a country, they just cut, cut trees down. They cut them down to clear land for agriculture. Some of the biggest clear cuts, or if you like, the biggest deforestations in British Columbia are for cities and for agriculture. If you like, the biggest clear cut is the lower Fraser Valley for agriculture, and that's a good thing to do because we put a very high, high value on food, and so we just get rid of forests so that we can grow food. Uh, but then as the population builds up, you cut more and more trees, more and more forests, and eventually that leads to local resource depletion. Unregulated exploitation of forests has always, and will always eventually lead to local resource depletion. The answer to that is to go and steal someone else's forests. You have a war, or you have a trade war, a war and you colonize another country, and you, you take their timber, but usually you finish up exploiting that, and creating shortages there, and finally, there's nowhere else to go, and you have to bite the bullet and institute regulations that attempt to achieve sustained supplies of whatever it is you want from the forest. Clean water, wildlife, timber, recreational opportunities, or whatever. However, the first stage in forestry where we introduce these regulations that I call here the administrative phase has always, and I think always will be, unsuccessful. It's always been unsuccessful. Why? Because it's based upon a lack of understanding of the biology and the ecology of the resource that is 
being conserved or they're trying to conserve. So administrative forestry that lacks a sound basis in ecology and soil science and climatology, it fails. It always has, it always will. Nothing surprising about it. It fails to achieve sustained yield and the conservation that we seek. That then leads to the third stage of forestry. That is ecologically based forestry where you recognize you're dealing with a living, changing, dynamic resource. You can't frame it and hang it on the wall like grandfather, unchanging forever. It changes. And you have to have policies that reflect that change over time, the change from one place to another. And that has usually led to sustained yield of various resources and maintained environmental quality. However, that is not necessarily the end of the evolution of forestry, because forestry that is sustainable and maintains environmental quality may not satisfy everything that people want from the forest. For example, some very ugly forest harvesting and forest management that does not please aesthetically may be completely sustainable and completely compatible with a high quality environment, but it sure doesn't look nice. And we happen to be a species that puts great stock on how things look. Look at the fashion industry, look at the cosmetics industry, look at the money that's spent on making cars look nice so that we'll buy them. Look at our art galleries. We as a species put a lot of value on how things look. And sustainable forestry, environmentally sound forestry, cannot, is not necessarily attractive to look at. In fact, some of the new forestry coming out of Oregon is rather unattractive to look at, but it may be very environmentally sound. So the next stage of forestry is a social stage in which we practice not only sustainable environmentally sound forestry, but forestry that satisfies a number of other values like aesthetics, like recreation, perhaps spiritual values. Particularly in an increasingly urbanized society, we have to think about these values and make sure that we provide them in various places in the forested landscape. Now, uh, I maintain that that, can, that pattern can be recognized many places around the world in many different countries. Where do we fit in in British Columbia? Well, Canada is a very young country, and forestry in Canada is even younger. Our forest history out here in BC is even younger still, is a very, very recent history. So we only started emerging from unregulated exploitation with the Fulton Commission of 1907 which was really the beginnings of the end of straight exploitive forestry. We didn't complete the transition to administrative stage of forestry until the second Sloan Commission in 1955. For most of us in here, that's pretty recent. So we, we entered the administrative phase and it took only about 15 to 20 years, up until about the mid 70s, for it to be realized increasingly by the public and increasingly by industry and the Ministry of Forests that it wasn't working that what was being done was not achieving that which was set out to be achieved in the various commissions. And why? Surprise, surprise, it was an administrative, non-biological, non-ecological approach. No surprises, entirely predictable. And so, starting in 1975, the ministry moved towards establishing an ecological basis for forest management in this province. And that was by adopting the work of Professor Kraina and his students at the Department of Botany at UBC, who had produced over the previous 25 to 30 years a world-class ecological site classification specifically for this purpose. Finally, forestry woke up and realized what Kraina was doing and adopted it. But it takes quite a time. Forestry, like Eartha Kitt's metaphorical Englishman, takes its time. It takes time. It's a long cycle. And when you start improving things, the evidence of the improvement often is not readily visible on the landscape for some time. It takes perhaps 15 or 20 years for it really to become obvious that things have improved as a result of going from administrative forestry to ecologically based forestry. And that was no problem in Scandinavia and Europe. They went through this series because they spent perhaps a century in this phase before society said, hold it, we want something else out of our forests as well, and they started moving towards the social stage. So there was lots of time to demonstrate that this was a workable system, even though it didn't satisfy everything that people wanted. Now in British Columbia, we started entering this phase in 1975. It wasn't written into the Forest Act until 1987. We are only just beginning the ecologically based phase of forestry, but at the same time that was happening, 
society had changed its mind about what it wanted from its forests. Many of the things that many of us feel very strongly about and very critical about are the result of decisions made during the administrative stage and were implemented 10, 15, 20 years ago. They are not necessarily what is being done today. And as we look at forestry, we have to be very careful to separate out things that we don't like that there were, uh, were the results or are the result of the administrative phase of the past and things that are actually being done today. That's one of the questions we have to address. So the problem here is that we're facing Alvin Toffler's future shock. Alvin Toffler said in his famous book that one of the problems in modern society is that the social conditions and desires are changing faster than institutions can respond. And this gives you future shock. It gives you conflict between people and the institutions that serve them. And I think we've got future shock in forestry because rather than the normal sequence of going to the administrative phase, it fails, ecologically based phase, it does some good things, but then we go on after a while to the social phase. We are struggling to enter the social phase almost before we've entered the ecologically based phase. In fact, we're entering them both together. And I think some of our conflicts stem from that getting out of step with the normal uh, historical sequence of events. Now, we should all be very concerned about local things. You know the old saying, think globally, act locally. We have got to look at the small, the detail, and the local problems of conservation and resource management. But I would suggest we reevaluate that admonition to think globally, act locally, but keep thinking globally. I'm extremely concerned as a professional ecologist that if we put all our eggs in the local conservation basket, and don't periodically check over our shoulder, we may be overwhelmed by global environmental changes that may frustrate the very best efforts we make at the local level. In particular, the threat of global climate change, which, which could cause forest types to move 300 to 500 kilometers north, and three to 500 meters up the mountains, the valley bottoms around here might be grassland. So all our attempts to conserve the forest types we now have could be totally frustrated, irrespective of the kind of harvesting system we use, because there might not be forests here anymore, because the climate would have changed to be inappropriate for forest vegetation. If we look at the really serious problems that threaten the Earth, it is the human population growth. We're now at 5.7 billion people. The optimistic assumption is that this will go up to somewhere between 11 uh, perhaps 10 and a half, 11 billion people. That's the most optimistic. Pessimistic, but nevertheless perhaps realistic, is 16 billion. The optimistic is double the present population. By the time seedlings that were planted this summer are ready for harvest around here, there will be twice as many people in the world. Realistically, but perhaps pessimistically, there will be three times as many people in the world. China is currently undergoing a population explosion. Apparently, if one can read the population statistics, in the next 10 years, China's population will increase by about 100 million people, thanks to Chairman Mao's policies of 30 years ago, where he encouraged Chinese women to have as many babies as, as they could. And in spite of the reversal towards the one-child family, average family size is still 2.7 in China, and you have an enormous number of women just entering the childbearing years, and this is predicted to give a 100 million increase. The Chinese are on the brink of industrialization, and they intend to drive that industrialization by using their vast reserves of sulfur-bearing coal. The air pollution and the possible greenhouse effects and climate change that could accompany that and other population increases around the world could totally frustrate our conservation efforts if we don't think about those conservation efforts in the context of these larger issues over which we may have frustratingly little control. And we had a very eminent international ecologist giving the Ida Green lecture at UBC in ecology recently, and he came across from Britain, and he said, if you want to prevent species extinctions, yes, we can worry about the spotted owl and species like that, but if we focus on that and forget the bigger issues, we are going to see hundreds or thousands of species extinctions because of climate change. So we have to look at where we're putting our conservation efforts if we are really serious about achieving local conservation. We've got to work on the national and international scene as well as the local scene. I'll talk more about the greenhouse effect later. <coughs>
So it was the conclusion of the United Nations Commission on Environmental and De Environment and Development, chaired by Madame Brundtland of Norway, that the, although the industrialized countries, including Canada, to this point in history bear the greatest single responsibility <coughs> for environmental degradation because of our, our uh, profligate use of resources, because of our selfishness, because of our very high standards of living, and because of our wastefulness, there's no question, it's our fault collectively. It's not them, it's not industry, because we buy the things from industry. It, it's all of us that allows industry to operate in the way it does, and encourages, us, encourages them to operate by buying the things that they produce for us to buy. So us collectively as a society are responsible for what has happened in the world to this point. However, we are not the long-term problem. Maslow, a very well-known psychologist, suggested in Maslow's hierarchy that there is a hierarchy of human needs that must be satisfied. First, there is food. Then there is shelter. Then there is security. Then there is other things, including environment. If you don't have food, if you have children, and you're a third world, world parent, and your child is starving to death, you will probably cut down the last tree, even if it means the mountain collapses into the valley because that's the way parents are towards their crying, cold, starving babies. So the greatest long-term threat is poverty in the third world. That's three quarters, going on 80% of the world's population are poor because of unequal distribution of wealth, expenditures on military hardware rather than people, and simple poverty. And unless we address that issue, that is likely to overwhelm the best conservation efforts that we can apply. So we really have to think about our local conservation and resource management issues in the larger context if we want to succeed. Now I'm convinced that we need to change the way in which the world's forests are being managed. And I want to go through a few issues. I think if we're going to survive as a species and maintain the environment we want, this has to be done. And let's go through some of these issues. I'll start with tropical deforestation because it's one that we see so frequently on the television and hear so frequently in the media. I must say, however, that when I read in the newspaper or hear on the radio statements that forestry in British Columbia is no different than, or worse than, deforestation in the tropics, I can only conclude that the person who made the statement hasn't been there, or if they have, they didn't understand what they saw. Here's an area of central Brazilian savanna, an area of hundreds of thousands of square kilometers, maybe millions that only 90 years ago carried a forest of average stature of about 30 meters tall and perhaps uh, 60 to 80 centimeters diameter of breast height on a mature individual. These trees are about two meters tall and are about 25 years old. Three cutting cycles to produce charcoal to provide fuel for the expand, rapidly expanding population, burning of the area for cattle grazing to feed the rapidly expanding uh, peasant population, have so degraded that environment that it is not capable of growing a forest now. I haven't seen anything in British Columbia that remotely resembles that. Here is an area of the wet tropics. This is close to the capital of Manaus in the heart of Amazonia. Very, very ancient soils, very deeply weathered, largely silica and aluminum oxides, an average pH of the mineral soil of about 3.2, something like the pH of vinegar. If you stick your hand in there for a couple of days, your skin starts peeling off. That stuff is really acid. All of the nutrients in this kind of environment are up in the vegetation. This is degraded secondary forest. It's already been cut once, but the, the forest was allowed to invade. If you strip the forest and burn it and maintain agriculture here for a few years, the area gets uh, so acidic again and so depleted of nutrients that nothing can grow there. I saw areas down there that had been disturbed 80 years ago, and they were a wet, white desert wet because you're in the tropics, but a desert. Nothing was growing. After 80 years, there were no weeds. There was nothing on the sand. It was just bare sand and aluminum oxide type of materials. Again, there is a soil called Seaback Sands, east of Prince George, which is a post-glacial delta, which is supposedly one of the poorest mineral soils in British Columbia. And there are certainly some parallels, considering the nutrient distribution and the sensitivity of those Seaback Sands. Um, some parallels to the tropics, but for the majority of British Columbia that has geologically young soils with very good reserves of erodible mineral, um, uh, weatherable minerals, 
there is simply no useful parallel. The speed of uh, nutrient cycling processes in the hot, wet environment of the tropics compared with our frequently cold forests where the problem is processes going too slowly, again, there are simply no useful parallels. There are, of course, enormous concerns about what's happening in the tropics. The, the tropical forest isn't the lungs of the earth, the way you sometimes hear. If that were true, there would be 40 or 50 feet of organic matter on the soil in the tropics because for oxygen to be released, carbon has to be stored. And there is very little carbon stored in most of, the tr of these tropical forests. In some of the poor ones, there is a peat soil, but in most of them, there is very little organic matter. So in fact, they are carbon, uh, in the undisturbed condition, they are carbon and oxygen neutral. But they do play a very important role in world climate and, and in regional climate. And massive deforestation, which is a land use change issue, not so much a forest management issue, uh, that has very, very serious implications for the people there and for everyone in the world. And the attempts to apply northern temperate plantation forestry, uh, most inappropriate. Here is the kind of plantation that turned Ludwig from a billionaire into a millionaire. Uh, stripping primary tropical rainforest in areas like Jari, this area is, is more up towards the Venezuelan border, uh, stripping the tropical rainforest and burning it and planting Malina arborea from West Africa. It grew about 15 feet the first year, about 6 feet the second year, about 1 foot the third year, and then died. Um, obviously, totally ecologically insensitive, total lack of understanding of how that ecosystem works, and total biological simplification, very low diversity in that plantation compared with there. There are some very serious problems in the tropics, and we have to change the way the tropical forests are managed. Not all tropical forests are so sensitive. There are some very fertile tropical soils. There are tropical soils that will support permanent, sustainable agriculture, if it's done carefully, and areas that will support sustainable forestry, even high-yield forestry. But there are certainly areas of the tropics like these that are very sensitive, and we must change the way those forests are being managed. Now, if you're a farmer, you may have a, a herd of cows, a crop of corn, and a field of cabbages. You can sell, and perhaps you will periodically sell those three crops, but you still have a farm. A farm is a, a landscape area that has a soil and a climate that uh, makes you able to grow crops that you can sell and thereby make a living. Well, forests are somewhat the same. A forest from which you've cut the trees down is still a forest if you have the soil intact and you have the climate and you have the seeds to re replant the trees. If, on the other hand, you lose the soil, you no longer have a farm, and if you lose the soil, you no longer have a forest, at least not until that soil has recovered. So here are some horror stories, and I can usually out-horror any environmentalist if I dig deeply into my slide collection. Uh, many of my slides are from 20 years ago. Uh, I have fewer horror stories recently. Perhaps that's because I don't get out as much, but I think it's also from what I've seen, particularly in some fairly extensive field visits I've made recently, that there are fewer of these. I hope so. So anyway, this is on Vancouver Island on highly erodible vol volcanic soils, skidding straight up and down slopes, absolutely unacceptable, absolutely inappropriate, and we simply can't do that if we want to have sustainable forestry. Here is an escaped slash burn on organic soils over limestone on the west coast of Vancouver Island. And there have been cases where, in the era of paranoia about fire, that the ministry required companies to burn on such sites. Absolutely inappropriate. Enormous ecological change. This site will carry trees again, but it'll be a long time in the future, and we are not prepared as a society to accept that long delay in gaining social values of various types from that landscape. Here is a slide taken about 18, 19 years ago down southeast of Cranbrook. Um, a very, very excessive disturbance from skid roads, compaction, loss of topsoil, erosion where the skid roads were put too steeply up and down, especially if the material was fine textured, silty soils which are common in this part of the world. Large landings, not rehabilitated, Massive loss of productivity over a significant part of that area for a substantial period of time. We don't know how long, but certainly absolutely unacceptable uh, in the context of sustainable forestry. This is not British Columbia, I, I'm glad to say, although I dare say this happens. This is Oregon. Here is skidder logging during the winter 
on a clay soil. In, in, you've probably heard that much of Vancouver is getting rebuilt. We're getting all these monster houses. I've got 10 of them on my block right now. And a house is, an old house is made of wood and plaster and wires and glass. And when the bulldozer has been through it for half an hour, it, all the parts are still there, but they're in a little pile on the ground. It's no longer a house. Well, soil's the same. A house has an architecture. That's what makes it a house. Soil has architecture too. And if you rearrange the pieces so that you lose that architecture, then it's no longer a soil and no longer capable of growing plants the way a soil can. So this is like the bulldozed houses in Vancouver. This soil has lost its architecture. And in some places in Oregon, apparently it's taking more than 80 years for such soils to recover significantly. If you're in a very northern environment where you get a great deal of frost heaving and frost uh, thawing, freezing cycles, such damage is repaired much more rapidly. Still unacceptably long, but certainly there is variation in how long this kind of damage takes to recover. Down in Oregon, this is absolutely disastrous because in their mild climates, this kind of damage is exceedingly persistent and quite unacceptable. Climate change. We've all heard about the greenhouse effect, the release of various kinds of gases into the atmosphere that trap solar heat. Light comes through, re reflected as heat, and that gets trapped in the atmosphere. Of course, we have absolutely no evidence that climate change is occurring. The fact that eight of the hottest years in the last hundred years were in the 1980s, and the hottest year of the century was in the 1980s, two years ago, doesn't prove a thing, because statistical variation in the climate could explain that alone. We don't yet, because climates are always varying. So we don't have statistical proof. However, that doesn't uh, convince me at all. If you look at the evidence on the release of greenhouse gases, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s, the 90s, what we're going to do as a society if we don't get our act together, and what, we, what is expected to happen through the 2020s based upon predicted human population growth, and the anticipated use by that population of various, or released by that population of various greenhouse gases. This is what is going to cause the greenhouse, uh, sorry, the climate change that I believe is going to occur and is, if we don't do anything about it, going to threaten our best conservation efforts at the local, le local level. And it's all of us. We all drive cars and we all heat our houses and we all waste a bit. And we have to look at everything we do, including forestry, to ask whether or not we are contributing significantly, either positively or negatively, to the greenhouse effect. Then there's air pollution and acid rain. You know, when I was growing up in England, oh, by the way, here's a clear, sunny day in midsummer in England, taken from an airplane. When I was a, a lad growing up in England, I used to wonder why I never got a sunburn when I took my shirt off in the summer. I used to wonder why I, I had never seen a sharp shadow until I came to New Brunswick in 1961. Because the shadows in England aren't sharp in the summer, they're fuzzy around the edges because the air is so polluted. Most of Europe sits most of the year under an incredible cloud of air pollution, and we enjoy great clarity of air most of the time in British Columbia, although living in Vancouver, I'm beginning to doubt that more and more. The, the big smoke is becoming a reality. And if the Chinese get together and have their population explosion and industrialize, we may well enjoy some of their air pollution too, all of us. Well, you've heard about the damage to the Black Forest, and here indeed is the Black Forest dropping apart at the hinges as a result of air pollution and acid rain. But it's interesting, to get to the bottom of conservation issues, you've got to understand them. Now, we had to drive, this is near Freiburg in the Black Forest, we had to drive quite a long way to find any dead trees. I'll tell you the story about these dead trees. These trees were killed by bark beetles. The trees became susceptible to bark beetles because they were stressed by drought. Now, they've always been stressed by drought periodically, but they hadn't been killed by bark beetles before. Why were they stressed by drought? They were stressed by drought because the rain around here contains about 70 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year, which is a heck of a lot of nitrogen. On the coast in BC, we get about four or five kilograms a year. Here, you might, I don't know how much you get. You may get three, you may get five, but it's not very much. They get 70. Now, these soils are granitic soils. They have very little magnesium. And if you add too much nitrogen to a soil that doesn't have magnesium, it causes physiological stress in the trees and the roots die. That means they're susceptible to drought. When they're stressed by drought, they become susceptible to bark beetles.
So, yes, ultimately, it's the acid rain and the nitrogen that's causing this, but it's a very complex scenario. Without the drought, they wouldn't be dying. Without the bark beetles, they wouldn't be dying. If you put dolomitic limestone on here that contains, nit uh, contains magnesium, they don't die. So if we want to understand the problem, we really do have to understand it. Now, they thought the nitrogen was coming from industry and German Mercedes-Benz whizzing up and down the autobahns at 160 kilometers. Well, it turns out that the major problem is farming in the Netherlands. Where? Because we in the Western societies, when we go shopping, we usually buy the cheap chickens on special. We like cheap food, we buy the specials. That drives agriculture into production methods that tend to produce an awful lot of ammonia. These range uh, houses that produce these incredibly cheap chickens, um, uh, very uh, massive production of, of pork and beef, that produces huge quantities of animal manure that all gets spread on the land in the Netherlands. That much of that volatilizes as ammonia. That causes the acid rain in the Black Forest that's doing this in some places. So firstly, we have to understand that it's really society demanding cheap food, driving the farmers in the Netherlands to produce agriculture in a way that produces heavy nitrogen deposits in the Black Forest that is the main problem. It is not the industry and it is not the cars that was originally thought. So we have to understand that before we can solve the problem. And we also have to understand that when you read in the paper that all of the Black Forest is dying, that simply isn't true. However, when you go to the Harz Mountains, it is true. You have massive deforestation occurring in some mountains in northern Germany and in eastern Germany. Whole mountain ranges have completely lost their forests and will not grow coniferous trees now because of sulfur, not nitrogen now, sulfur pollution and ozone damage. So air pollution is a tremendous threat to the world's forests. Different kinds of air pollution cause different <coughs> problems. If we're going to get on top of that particular threat to forests, we have to understand which is the problem in a particular place. Because something that gets rid of nitrogen problem in the black forest will not solve this sulfur problem. Something that solves the sulfur problem will not solve the black forest problem. So we have to be very specific in dealing with these environmental issues. And then, of course, one of the major things is social change. People have changed what they want from forested landscapes. It is not many decades since the society in Australia thought that the best thing to do to trees like that was to cut them up into two by sixes. Now the Australian society feels trees like that are very huggable, and I rather agree with them that trees like that have something very special, something spiritual, and we must ensure that we conserve enough of trees like that for future generations to enjoy. And the same thing in the Queen Charlotte's or the Kamana. Uh, in this province, we need areas of big spruce and big cedars. We don't need them everywhere, but we need enough of them accessible to urban populations and other people so that we can enjoy the spiritual and emotional values of this kind of forest that is very important to many of us. So all those changes need to be undertaken. Now, how are we going to achieve that change? Well, I believe there's two stages. The first stage is the political phase, and here I would like to pay tremendous tribute to the environmentalist movement. Academics and scientists like me have been singularly unsuccessful, and perhaps we haven't even made enough effort to, uh, and where we have, it's not worked, to make the public aware that there are tremendous environmental problems that need to be addressed, that we need to change the way we're managing our forests. Now, forest managers also, foresters have been complaining in Canada for decades about the quality of forest management in Canada. It was a group of professional foresters who marched on Ottawa at the beginning of this decade, not the last decade, the beginning of the 1980s, to demand that the federal government put more money into the management of Canada's forests, because Canada's forests were a disgrace. And the government became persuaded, and they put the $600 million Forest Resources Development Agreement in place that has substantially uh, ameliorated the problems. Not finished yet. We need another further. And if you want to do something good for conservation of forestry, write to your local MLA and say, we need another further because the mistakes that were made in the past must be rectified. And that was professional foresters, but that did not convince the public that there was a major problem. And because the public weren't convinced, the politicians weren't convinced on a broad scale. It is the environmental movement, through their rhetoric, their determination, their commitment, their sometimes verbally violent statements, and their sometimes scientifically wrong statements, 
that perform the absolutely essential first stage of conservation, and that is the greening of politicians. That requires the greening of society, and I think only the environmentalist movement could have done that, and I think they had to use those tools in many cases, because the science, the logic, didn't work, didn't do the job. However, you don't actually achieve conservation by achieving the political phase of conservation. What you do is make it possible. Without the political phase, it isn't possible. But with that in hand, you then need to move on to the second phase, and that's the implementation phase. In a democracy, change comes through policy and regulation that is driven by legislation. But if we put the wrong regulation and policy and we have the wrong legislation, we won't get the conservation we need. Witness trying to solve the Black Forest's acid rain problem. If they had applied the policies for the Hartz Mountains, there's no way they would have, well, they haven't dealt with it yet, but there was no way they would be able to deal with the Black Forest, and vice versa. Looking at it from a Black Forest perspective, they would not be able to deal with the acid rain problem of the Hartz Mountains and the Fichtekenberger and those other mountain ranges. So we have to take the level of the debate from the level that is necessary in many cases to achieve the political goals of conservation. We have to take it to a socially realistic and scientifically sound level so that we get the policies, regulations, and legislation that will achieve the conservation we want. Let me give you a couple of examples. Well-meaning environmentalists in some European countries have recently passed legislation banning the importation of tropical hardwoods in a, an attempt to try to limit deforestation in the tropics. A very worthwhile goal. But I hear from ecologists and resource managers in some Asian countries at a couple of conventions, one on tropical forests this summer, that in some countries this has resulted in a doubling of the deforestation. There are many people who have been displaced over the last 20 years from cities and now live in the forest. Maybe they shouldn't because they're displacing the native peoples. Rightly or wrongly, I'm not debating that issue. The fact is those people are there and they have children, lots of them, and they're hungry and they're somet sometimes cold. And the people who live with those children in those forests harvest hardwoods that they sell to us for how many of you have teak furniture in your bedrooms? We buy the stuff and we provide a living for those people in the tropics. By taking the value away from the forest, those people have no living, so they cut the forest down and grow food crops, which they can sell and feed their children with. So in some of the countries, this particular policy has had exactly the opposite effect because it was socially unrealistic. It didn't recognize the social realities of some of the environments where they were trying to contribute positively towards conservation. Another example is you've heard of the ivory hunting and the hunting of rhinoceroses in East Africa. Well, the logical thing to do is to ban hunting. It seems like a very good idea, but that created a black market in many countries. And the price of the ivory and the rhinoceros tusks for aphrodisiacs went up so high that even the police and the army couldn't stop them because the poachers were better armed and had greater numbers. In Zimbabwe, the wildlife biologists and conservationists are trying another approach. They have studied the wildlife populations and they've calculated how many of each species and which age of animals of the various trophy animals can be harvested and sustain the populations into the future and keep those populations healthy. They sell those hunting licenses to the local people. The local people then can sell them to hunters from the United States, Germany, Japan, people who pay enormous sums of money to go and shoot these trophy animals. Apparently they like to do that. And this provides a sustainable local economy for these people, and these people jealously guard and protect the wildlife. Poachers have their throats slit. You don't need police, and you don't need the army. Now, I'm told by African experts that will not work in every African country because of problems of corruption and bribery and political organization. But there are some countries in which it does work, it is working, and as we try to protect the wildlife resources of Africa, we have to look very, in a sophisticated fashion at the local sociology, the political environment, and the ecology so that we come up with the right approaches to achieve the conservation. So we need socially and ecologically sound conservation policy. We also need socially and ecologically sound forest harvesting policy and management policy, other things other than harvesting.
But in seeking this, once again, we must avoid generalizations if we wish to be successful. Here is the biogeoclimatic zone map originally developed by Professor Kraina and his students and subsequently developed by the pedologists and ecologists and other people in the Ministry of Forests. It's world class. I don't know of any better around the world. I know of some very good ones in other countries. But this map embodies the, uh, a really outstanding ecological basis for the management of forest resources in this province. It doesn't solve all the problems, however, but it provides a basis from which we can begin to solve them. And there are 14 different biogeoclimatic zones in the province, the 14 different colors in the map here, and 12 of them are forested. Most of those have three to five different subzones, ecologically uh, distinct areas within the ecological zone, and most of those have between three and seven distinct forest types within each subzone. There might be somewhere between three and four hundred different types of forest within British Columbia. If we want to get conservation of the resources in those different forest types, we have to render our management ecologically sensitive to those differences. And many of the problems of British Columbia forestry came because in the administrative phase of forestry, uh, regulations were put in place that, that told foresters to do the same thing everywhere, slash burn all sites. That was the instruction from the ministry, because that was the policy. Clear cut on the coast, slash burn and plant Douglas fir from sea level to the alpine. That was the policy. And we found it didn't work, and we are now moving to a much more ecologically based strategy. And I think I have witnessed a remarkable change in the way forests are being managed over the last 15 years. But it would be a, a unique irony if the people of this province 50 years from now looked back and saw the tremendous contributions the environmental movement had made to making change possible, but then saw that by failing to move the level of the debate to a socially uh, sophisticated and ecologically sophisticated level, that the very same movement had frustrated the efforts to, to achieve conservation by not basing the conservation policies and regulations on this ecological variability and on the social variability within this province. People are part of it, nature is part of it, we have to recognize the variability of both. Well, leaving that essentially background material, the context in which we must struggle with these difficult decisions about how to manage our forest resources, I'd like to quickly go through a technical list of some of the questions that need to be asked. Firstly, the components of ecosystems. How are they affected by clear cutting or by alternative harvesting systems? I'm going to focus on clear cutting because often it makes the most extreme change. There's no question that clear cutting results in a very significant alteration of the microclimate of the harvested area. That's really the definition of clear cutting where the microclimate has been lost. And in some parts of British Columbia, particularly the hot, dry southern interior valleys, if you remove the forest microclimate, it is extraordinarily difficult to reforest the area. You've created grassland, and it'll remain that way for a long, long time. If you want grassland, that's a fine thing to do. But if you want forest, then clear cutting becomes inappropriate. In some of the interior Douglas fir zone, particularly the dry subzone again, and particularly on hot, dry south-facing slopes, Clear cutting is quite inappropriate because of the undesirable microclimatic change. However, when you go up to some of our high elevation forests that have very cold soils, and some of our far northern forests, the changed microclimate, the warming of soils, becomes extremely important to get the forest regenerated the way we want. And on some of our very humid, cool west coast climates, if we want to grow certain light demanding tree species, again, we must create the open microclimates that characterize clear cuts. In fact, in Sweden, uh, about 20 or so years ago, 30 years ago, they passed a law requiring clear cutting. I don't like that. I don't like requiring that one thing be done everywhere. I think that's, that's an inappropriate approach. But the reason they made that rather wrong decision, I think, was because for the previous 50 years, they had largely practiced selection or selective logging in northern cold areas that resulted in a degradation of their forests. If you ask wildlife authorities from, Africa, from Alaska, the reason why Alaska is so famous for its wildlife is Alaska burns over about every 60 years. That disturbance is essential in that northern cold environment because in the absence of fire, 
for more than a couple of hundred years, muskeg develops over much of the landscape. You don't have forest, it turns into muskeg. So in that environment, the disturbance of fire or logging or insects or disease, something that removes the forest microclimate is essential to maintain what we think of as a productive forest and productive wildlife habitat. Similarly, in some of Sweden's northern forests, our high elevation forests and our northern forests, it may be highly desirable to have that exposed clear cut. So we have some areas where we don't like the microclimate change, some areas where we do. There are some areas where it really doesn't matter. It's fine. It's, it'll work either way, and we have a choice, and we have to look at all the other things to decide on that choice. It depends upon the species we want to grow, but we don't have to, uh, and, and it isn't a case of absolutely forbidding it. Soils. Well, there's no question that clear-cutting and other harvesting systems can have a dramatic effect on soils. Greg Utzig, who's in the audience here, uh, put out a very valuable report uh, a number of years ago reporting that a, a loss of social value of about $80 million a year in the province from damage to soils. So we absolutely cannot tolerate continuing significant damage to soils. We have to look at that, but in many cases, clear-cutting does not damage soils. In fact, very often, clear-cutting creates such little disturbance of soils that foresters then have to spend a lot of money and time going in and disturbing the soil so that trees can become re-established. However, there are cases where there are problems and generally they are associated with roads. Here are some more 20-year-old slides from coast where inappropriate road building techniques, side casting leading to instability and the loss of soil over here are going to result in prolonged loss of productivity of this area. This area is reforested now, it is growing trees but not as well as the trees over here. Here's another case where this road here has created instability, side casting above has contributed in a loss of soil right down to the compacted underlying material. Uh, a prolonged loss of productivity on that site. So very often our clear-cut problems with soils are road problems. They're not the fact that all the trees have been removed and the microclimatic influence has been lost. And sometimes we can have significant problems from non-clear-cut methods. Some of the recent slides that have caused some tragedies and have attracted a lot of attention have originated from roads in areas that were selectively logged in the last 30 to 40 years, a time at which roads were not put to bed and culverts were not removed as they now must be and ho I hope are, when harvesting is finished, and some of those old roads are in some cases the origin of these problems. It isn't the fact, uh, it isn't the fact that the area was harvested, it was the fact that the roads created problems, and that can occur in clear cuts and alternative areas. So roads are often the problem. Not always, but very often. Vegetation, whoops, I went too fast. Vegetation, yes indeed, when we clear cut, we, by changing the microclimate, we cause dramatic changes in vegetation. We get fireweed, we get lots of flowering plants, we get lots of shrubs coming in that do not do nearly so well, and not nearly so abundant in partially harvested areas because partially harvested areas don't have the conditions that favor those particular early successional species. And in fact, most clear cuts have very high diversity of vascular plant species, often very much higher diversity than the forests that have just been harvested. However, that diversity doesn't remain because the process of vegetation succession proceeds, trees usually invade, they shade out the shrubs and herbs, there is a period of greatly reduced diversity, and gradually the forest uh, plant competition, vegetation composition returns towards its original condition. In non-clear-cut methods, there is a much less dramatic change in the vegetation on the area, but once the harvest is completed, it also starts moving back towards the, little, the, the original condition. Some of the vegetation changes are considered desirable. For example, there are trees we'd like to grow will only grow in clear cuts. They won't regenerate effectively in some of the partial cut systems. Uh, sometimes uh, the microclimate we've created and the vegetation we get is not what we want and we would be better off with a partial cut system. Microbial life. Yes, indeed, dramatic changes in the microbes. Many soils in forested areas are dominated by fungi and the animals that are associated therewith. That often makes the forest floor thick and acidic. That's the nature of mature forest ecosystems. 
Following clear cutting, there is a substantial loss of the fungal component of the soil and a replacement by bacterial species that cause much faster decomposition of the organic matter, an increase in fertility and often a reduction in the acidity of the forest floor, all of which is often very desirable for wildlife because it gives more nutritious plants for the wildlife to feed on, many of the grazing and browsing animals to feed on, and it is also very favorable for the early growth of new, a new forest. However, just like the plants, uh, as the plants grow back towards the forest, the bacterial dominance is gradually lost and there is a gradual return to fungal domination and eventually as you get a mature forest and a forest influence, you reestablish much the same original microbial community as you had in the, the original forest. Wildlife, something that concerns all of us. Well, again, wildlife is like the, the microbial life. It's a question of habitat. They depend upon the vegetation. There are some species that need the vegetation of a mature old growth forest. Uh, woodland caribou, spotted owl, there are a few species that have virtually an absolute dependence upon mature old growth forest. There are also some species that have an al almost an absolute dependence on open areas. There are birds and animals that really do depend on accessing or having ex access to disturbed ecosystems, whether it's fire, insects, wind, disease, or logging, it doesn't really matter. And if you don't have disturbed areas in a forest, those species will either go extinct or they will completely disappear over large areas. So, you see, nature's, nature doesn't judge whether a, a sparrow in a clear cut is better or, or worse than a spotted owl in an old growth forest. It doesn't say that a fern in a mature forest is better or worse than a fireweed in a clear cut. They just are, they just exist. Evolution has produced species that benefit from or require either disturbed ecosystems or undisturbed ecosystems or something in the middle. And there's a lot of species that don't really care and can make their living in all sorts of places. So it is us as society that makes those, those judgments. And in fact, we often use terms, and there is a couple of mistakes on my slide for which I should get a D minus on my ecology exam because I've used the term ecologically sound. There isn't such a term. It's environmentally sound. Ecology is a science. It describes, it explains, it helps us to understand how ecosystems work, how organisms live, how ecosystems respond to disturbance, and how they recover from disturbance. It <coughs> makes absolutely no judgments about those, those eroded soils versus mature forests. They are just two different conditions of the ecosystem. And ecology helps you understand the consequences for society of those different conditions. It is us in society that says what we want. How many uh, spotted owls do we want? How many sparrows? How much fireweed? How many ferns? That's our judgment, and we have every right to make that judgment. So wildlife is a question of habitat. There are species that benefit from clear cuts. There are species that benefit from partial clear cuts. And we have to decide what is the spectrum of wildlife and what is the relative abundance of different species that we require in our forests. Then we can set about harvesting and managing forests to produce vegetation conditions that, in fact, produce the habitat conditions required by those species. Fish and water. Very important. Fish is an important resource in this province, both for recreation and commercially, industrially. And water is very important because we all depend upon it for drinking and we like the aesthetics of clean water, lakes, etc. <coughs> no question that forest harvesting can have a significant effect on water and on the fish and other aquatic organisms that live in water bodies. But as we try to grapple with the question about what is the effect of harvesting, and okay, let's focus on clear cutting, what is the effect of clear cutting on streams, if you ask the question, what is the effect of clear-cutting on watersheds, I can't, I can't answer that question, because I haven't asked the question yet. If I say, what is the effect of clear-cutting on a first-order watershed, I can address the question. What is the effect on a third-order watershed, I can address the question. You see, all of British Columbia is in about three watersheds. And the Fraser River, as it runs out past Vancouver, I think is either an 11th or a 13th order watershed. Little trickle on the hillside, little tiny trickle, six inches a foot wide, perhaps going a few hundred meters down into a, a stream. That's a first order stream. The stream it goes into is a second order stream. That flows into a third order stream. That flows into a bigger fourth order stream, which we probably now call a river. 
and that flows into a bigger river, which is the fifth order. So the Fraser, when it goes down past New West, is probably 11th or 13th order. Clear cutting in British Columbia has no measurable effect on the quality or the regimen of the Fraser as it flows past the uh, uh, New Westminster. But clear cutting has the potential to have tremendous effects on first order streams. It can have a great effect on second order streams, that is a given clear cut. If the clear cut is big enough to include all of the watershed of a third order stream, it will have a tremendous effect on that third order water stream, that third order stream. But if, in fact, only about 20% of a third order watershed is clear cut, then as the water exits that third order watershed, there is usually very little measurable effect on the quality or the regimen of that stream. On the other hand, the first order stream in the clear cut is dramatically altered in terms of the amount of water flowing through it, the quality of that water, dissolved chemicals and perhaps sediments, and also the regimen, the peak flows, how much flows will probably dry up in the summer, peak, higher peak flows in the winter. So when we talk about the effects of clear cutting on water, we have to first address the scale that we're talking about. And consequently, when we talk about fish, we have to say which stream order is the fish moving in or is it living in before we can really address the question. Now, in the old days, clear cutting was done right down to lakes, right down to streams, and I guess sometimes mistakes are still being made. Uh, people who work in forests are humans. I expect there's some of them in this room, too. Um, that the fact is that things do not always go according to plan, but my understanding of the planning process is that that is no longer done according to the plan. But it used to be done, and yarding was done across the streams because many of the cat operators and the skidder operators, who are perfectly nice people, they're mostly weekend fishermen, um, never understood that that had a negative effect on what they did on weekends, that is to try to go out and have some recreation catching fish. Mostly when that's explained to them, they take a very different approach to things. So yes, there has been bad impacts of clear cutting on uh, water bodies, quality from clear cutting, uh, many of the bad impacts are related to roads, as I've already said, because of slides. Uh, generally speaking, where clear cutting is conducted with adequate riparian leaf strips and where roads are built in a fashion that does not cause erosion, uh, clear cut has very little effect on streams other than the first order streams that are flowing through those clear cut areas. Well, those are some ecological impacts. What about some ecosystem attributes and resource values that might be affected by a harvesting system? What about, what about biodiversity? We hear a lot about biodiversity. But once again, if you ask me what is the effect of clear cutting on biodiversity, I will tell you I can't answer because you haven't asked me a question yet. There is a diversity of biodiversities. Until, and until we establish which one we're talking about, I can't give you a scientific answer or any other kind of answer, come to think of it. I'm sorry this looks a bit academic, but I'll try to lead you quickly through this and as painlessly as possible, but it's necessary to understand the different <coughs> kinds of biodiversity if we're going to establish policies to protect biodiversity, whichever one we're talking about. Now, if you go out for a picnic in the woods and you sit down and whilst you're eating your picnic, you make a list of all the flowers and the mosses and the trees around you, uh, that is the alpha diversity of the plants in that ecosystem. But if you then go for a little walk after lunch into a different kind of forest on that mountain or hillside, and you make another species list, and you compare the two lists and see how many species are different between the two lists, that's the beta diversity of that forest. So this is the local diversity, and this is the diversity across the local landscape. And that diversity goes for the species and also the structure. You can be in a lodgepole pine forest with just a few mosses, maybe two species of mosses on the ground, no shrubs, no herbs, just one layer of old mature um, uh, lodgepole pine, very low uh, species and structural alpha diversity, and because old fires created such forests over large areas, maybe very low be beta diversity as well. Then there's landscape diversity. If you hike from the valley bottom here up to the tops of the mountains, you'll go through at least two biogeoclimatic zones. If you go from Penticton up to Silver Star, you go through five different biogeoclimatic zones. Enormous biological diversity across the landscape. Enormous differences in species lists and structures of forests, even though any one forest type within that elevational sequence might be quite low. The diversity might be quite low. Now we hear about the high alpha and structural, uh, high alpha and beta species and structural diversity of the tropical rainforest. 
Well, uh, mostly it's alpha diversity. We can have 400 species of tree in a hectare. We can have 1,000 species of animal in a hectare of forest in the tropics. So we have an enormous list. But if we walk for several kilometers, our species list may not change because many lowland tropical rainforests are very uniform over large areas. So they have low beta diversity, but very, very high alpha diversity. Many of our forests in our mountains have relatively low alpha diversity, but enormous beta diversity. So a complete reversal. Then there's landscape diversity that's going up the mountain to Silver Star. There's geographical diversity. If we go from Fort St. John across to Newfoundland, we're in boreal forest pretty well all the way but there's quite a diversity of boreal forest as we go across the country. That's broad geographical diversity. Then there's functional diversity. Some forests are very low productivity. They have few nutrients. They cycle slowly. Uh, some are very highly productive. There's temporal diversity. Clear cuts are often very diverse in their vascular plant species, much more often than the forests that were harvested. As they get reforested, the diversity of vascular plants goes below quite often the original forest. And as the uh, forest naturally thins or is thinned by foresters, understory redevelops, vascular diversity goes up again, often to higher than in an old growth forest, but again, finally it declines. And of course, I've left an important type of diversity off here that is genetic diversity. Genetic diversity is the means by which evolution has fine-tuned individual species to live in a variety of physical and chemical environments and different biological environments too. And it's very, very important in conservation and forest management that we conserve our genetic inheritance. And there are uh, rules and regulations in forestry to ensure that's done, but we have to keep struggling with that to make sure that in fact those rules and regulations are adequately protecting that genetic diversity. Ecosystem function. Yes, indeed, forest harvesting can have a dramatic effect on, um, e on ecosystem function as can natural disturbance. On the north end of Vancouver Island, there was a humongous windstorm in 1907. It's interesting, it was the same year as the Fulton Commission. Maybe nature didn't like the thought of going from unregulated exploitation to managed forestry, because it blew down about 40% of the forests on the north end of Vancouver Island. The forests that are there now, the natural second growth that came from that blowdown, has in places standing volumes of up to 1,500 cubic meters of wood per hectare. And it is growing in many places as much as 16 cubic meters per hectare per year. In the old growth that wasn't blown down, it's growing at between 1 and 3 cubic meters per hectare per year. And it has a standing volume of usable wood of sometimes about 500 cubic meters. So sometimes disturbed forests are very much more productive than undisturbed forests because very old mature forests in some environments, not all, but in some site types, in some biogeoclimatic subzones, undisturbed forests decline in their productivity. And sometimes harvesting enhances productivity. Sometimes forest harvesting, depending upon how it's done, reduces productivity because it has been mismanaged. And there are certainly far too many cases where that has happened in the past. And I'll return to that because there may be some cases where unwittingly that is still happening. Carbon storage, the greenhouse effect, one of the greatest single threats to species. Perhaps if the climate change occurs, we will have one of the greatest historical periods of species extinctions, courtesy not of our resource management, but courtesy of the action of all of us as a society in putting greenhouse gases up into the atmosphere. Now, old growth forests contain a lot of carbon, particularly those in humid areas, particularly on the coast. The, the forests around here are often I'm surprised that the forests I've seen today, remarkably little carbon. Much of this country was completely burned down to mineral soil about 100 years ago. Many of the beautiful, uh, rich, colored forests are that way because the miners 100 years ago burned off most of this country. Most of the watersheds, most of the lovely forests we have now were completely razed and probably before they did that there weren't nearly as many larch because larch are encouraged by fire and probably it looks much more beautiful now because the whole area was burnt over but that's a different story. So there isn't as much carbon in the forest I saw, and I suspect it's because the whole country was burnt to a crisp about 100 years ago. But on the coast, where the forests haven't been burnt for a long time, you do get huge quantities of carbon stored in the soil, in the forest floor, and in rotting logs, and in the standing trees. Actually, for the ecologists here, you'll notice this is the ICH, but I 
just happened to put it in. I didn't have a coastal one that was uh, quite what I wanted. Um, the ecologists here will have noticed that. I'm cheating a bit. Anyway, so there is a concern. There's a legitimate concern that in harvesting old growth forests, we are significantly contributing to the greenhouse effect. And if that's the case, we have to do something about it. Well, let's examine the issue. When you clear cut an old growth forest, because of the change in the microclimate and the stimulation of bacterial decomposition, much of this carbon will be decomposed and vented to the atmosphere and will contribute to the greenhouse problem. If we then, as is required by law in this province, reforest promptly, and now the law requires that it's much more prompt and jolly good too than it was in the past, um, if you look at the carbon storage in the new forest, because the new forest is made of carbon, um, you find generally that the amount of carbon that's lost in most of our old growth west coast forests will be recaptured by the new forest in between 30 and 60 years, depending upon the productivity of that forest. Now that new forest will not contain as much carbon as the old forest did, but it will have recaptured the, for the carbon that was released by decomposition from the forest floor and the soil. So, so what's the difference in storage? The difference in storage is what was harvested. It's the logs that were taken away. Now what happens to them? If we make them into timber and build the houses that we live in and the furniture we sit on and the other wooden things we use, then that carbon is stored, it does not go to the atmosphere, and in fact converting old growth forests to new second growth forests and managing them pr productively does not make a net addition of carbon to the atmosphere. However, if we take those harvested logs and turn them into pulp, for the newspapers we read every day, and for the toilet paper we use, and for the writing paper and all the other things we use, and then throw away so quickly, then that decomposes and the carbon dioxide goes back to the atmosphere, and so much of what was taken away from that system does go to the atmosphere, and harvesting those old growth makes a one-time, quite significant contribution to the atmosphere. If, however, we are profligate and do silly things, like putting all our waste, our diapers, disposable diapers, and newspapers, and all the other things we use, and we put them in a landfill site, as we have done uh, to a great extent, and they decompose anaerobically, they will turn, the carbon in those materials will turn into methane. Now, methane is 25 times worse than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. So, in fact, we would be very, very significantly contributing to the greenhouse problem, and it is now suspected that landfill sites across North America and other industrialized sites are one of the major reasons why methane is going up, and methane is one of the big problems in the greenhouse problem. So it means that we've got to get away from landfill sites, or we've got to cap them and use the methane as an energy source, and we've got to try to recycle carbon or burn it uh, instead of using fossil fuels, because if we burn wood products, that was carbon from the atmosphere, we're just putting it back again. If we displace fossil fuels to heat our homes, etc., that means we don't have to put the fossil fuel carbon up, and doing forestry is a net improvement of the greenhouse, thing, a greenhouse effect. So you can see it's very complex, and ultimately the bottom line is the major effect of harvesting forests in British Columbia on the greenhouse effect depends not so much on the age of the forest harvested or how it's harvested, but upon what you and I do with the harvested products. If we're sensible with them, we can minimize the negative impacts and, in fact, make forestry a net positive sink for carbon. If we are foolish with those harvested products and profligate, then that is making a net problem by harvesting old-growth forests. So it's a complicated issue, and the store is not in on that. We don't have all the answers. There's a lot of research being done, and within two or three years, we'll have a pretty good picture as to what the story is and how we should perhaps modify policies to take care of any um, adverse effects. However, just before I leave that, I should put it in perspective. It's been calculated by the Environmental Protection Agency in the US that about 20% of the, uh, all the carbon released to the atmosphere is by deforestation and harvesting of old growth forests. About 80% of that is deforestation in the tropics. So we're talking about 20 about 20% of 20% of the carbon dioxide is coming from harvesting old growth forests. But CO2 is only half the problem. The rest is chlorofluorocarbons in our hairsprays, in our refrigerators, in our air conditioners, in our cars, things like that, and from methane. So in fact, even if old growth harvesting does produce a net negative effect, it is very much less significant than what you and I do in heating our homes, driving our cars, 
and the various other greenhouse gas activities we, we participate in. Aesthetics, very important, and part of the social forestry phase that in fact forestry in this country has only come to very recently and has been obviously very slow to recognize the fact that forestry has not been aesthetic in the past. Clear cutting is never going to be beautiful in the short term on a particular site, but it doesn't have to be ugly in the landscape. Here you see uh, clear cuts that is revegetated down here in the landscape, and to me that in fact enhances the quality of that landscape because we have all rather uniform old growth forest here, uniform color texture, and this is to me a rather pleasant diversity of color and texture, just like the rocks and the mountains are. Of course I'm pulling your leg, that's not a clear cut. That's a natural disturbance that has created uh, a difference in vegetation, and, and I find it equally uh, attractive, whether it's natural or, or human-made. If there was an ugly road scar there, I, I probably wouldn't like it at all. But just a change in the texture and age and quality of vegetation in the landscape, if it is done with an eye to aesthetics, the shape, the location, it does not have to necessarily damage, at least not for very long, the visual quality of a landscape. So is the problem clear cutting or is it some other aspect of forest harvesting or forest management? Is the problem clear cutting or the harvesting equipment that's used? And I'd suggest to you that in many cases it's the harvesting equipment that produces the soil damage that puts all the skid roads, that in many cases we should be using cable logging or helicopter harvesting on steep slopes and not skidders. So very often the problems, the roads, and the direct impacts of clear cutting come from the equipment, not the fact that all the trees have been removed. Sometimes it's not clear cutting, it's the size of the clear cut. Clear cuts that are too big, so that they give either environmental problems, water quality, or aesthetic, or maybe wildlife problems. So smaller clear cuts may be, may be size, it's not the fact you're cutting all the trees. It may be the shape in terms of visuals. It may be the block location whether they're stacked up one next to the other, or whether they are distributed in the landscape. However, sometimes the answers to that question is not always obvious. Now here's some logging up in the Charlottes. The, this was back in the mid-70s, the kind of logging that was done, and, and society back in the 60s and 50s generally thought that's the way it was done and should be done. Nobody, well not nobody, but very few people complained very loudly about this. Generally people accepted it. Um, except it used to be done in squares. Now this cut is, is carefully feathered and by the time that's greened up in about 10 years that will be a lovely velvet green blanket of uniform forest and it'll look much as though a wildfire had been through the area and to me that will look very aesthetic. In contrast, scattered patches on the landscape to me can look very unnatural and very unesthetic. Now these are rather square and angular and certainly you can ameliorate the visual impact by having feathered edges and stuff like that, but it looks rather as though somebody got a giant shotgun with square bullets in it, square balls, and, and shot the landscape. In fact, nature doesn't do that. Nature produces a variety of patterns of disturbance on the landscape, a variety of shapes, a variety of locations. Nature produces lots of little patches, and some very big patches, and a whole bunch of intermediate patches. And it's now coming out of Oregon and Washington. A lot of the ecologists there are very concerned about harvesting policies that were instituted because of public pressure about big clear cuts and instituted by wildlife because they wanted to maximize the edge because there was a preoccupation with deer and elk and those kinds of wildlife species. That resulted in a fragmentation of the forest, which is having negative effects on those animals that need bigger patches of vegetation of one particular age. And these ecologists are now saying, look guys, we got it wrong. The public got it wrong. The wildlife guys got it wrong. Industry and government did what the public wanted, but now ecologists and the public have changed their mind, and so industry and government have to change back. But uh, I, I don't think we, sh we should reinvent the wheel and make the same mistake that was made down in Oregon and Washington. I think we should learn from their mistakes and we should institute policies that put disturbance in the landscape, whether it's partial cutting or clear cutting, that more closely mimic natural patterns of disturbance in the landscape. It'll be better for wildlife, it'll be more aesthetic, and I think that's what we should do. We should have a diversity of disturbance, not something like this that personally I don't think is the way we should do it. Is it clear cutting or is it post-harvesting site treatment? 
Now, sometimes you need to do post-harvest site treatment because you've done a big clear cut. Yes, that's true, but that is certainly not always the case. But here is another horror story on slash burning, uh, misapplication on thin rocky sites. Uh, that wasn't clear cutting that created that problem. This site could have regenerated without a slash burn, uh, but it was policy in those days. That's what people did. Everybody thought it, not everyone, some people thought it was a terrible idea at the time, but the authorities thought it was a good idea, so that's what was done. Please don't get the idea that I'm totally against slash burning. I hope that'll come up in the questioning. I would be very vehemently opposed to any policy that bans slash burning everywhere, just as I have always been vehemently opposed to policies of slash burning everything. Um, we can come to that in the discussion if you like. Sometimes it's mechanical site preparation. Here, I'm very glad to say, is not British Columbia. This is Nelson. Not this Nelson. Nelson, South Island, New Zealand. This is the Golden Downs Forest, Nelson, New Zealand. And here they have a tremendous problem with gorse int introduced from Britain. To plant here, you have to wear either a lead jock strap or a steel suit of armor. <laughs> because the gorse is about two meters tall, and if you know what gorse is, it's very prickly. And so what they do, what they did here, is they hired a kamikaze pilot and put him on a bulldozer and headed him downhill at about 35 kilometers an hour. And, and to slow himself down to that speed, he had to put his brush blade about a foot and a half down into the soil. So of course, there is no soil on this hillside anymore. It's all down in the valley in the stream. Absolutely terrible. Just absolutely appalling. Not the way to solve the problem. There was a problem there that needed solving. But it wasn't a problem of clear cutting. It was a problem of vegetation that had to be solved in fact, it would be even harder to solve it if it wasn't clear cut, but that was not the way to solve it. And here's another very sad research forester. He didn't do this, but he's extremely sad about it. Again, on the Canterbury Plains of South Island, New Zealand. The sad thing about this photograph is the forester who did this really thought he'd done a good job. And because he'd made planting very easy in the gravel. All the topsoil and all the slash and all everything had been scraped off into these sort of four to six foot, six meter tall piles across the landscape and research by the uh, Research Institute in New Zealand has demonstrated that you lose at least 50% of your productivity if you do this. And that's not clear cutting, that's post clear cutting site treatment. So we have to sort out the problem. It's like the Black Forest and the Harz Mountains. We can't cure the problems of acid rain over there unless we know what the problems are, or what the source of the problem is. We have to know the source of the problem here. It wasn't clear cutting, it was the way the site was treated. And finally, clear cutting and utilization. And here I come to an issue that I am very concerned about. And I think we probably do have a problem in British Columbia. Here is logging in central Sweden, mechanized harvesting, which harvests the whole tree, including the branches uh, of the hardwoods there and the spruce on a rather poor nutrient site. Research has shown a loss of about 25% harvestable yield from this site as a result of that whole tree harvesting or full tree harvesting. 25% loss of productivity to me, of site productivity, is quite unacceptable. Although just as an aside, it raises an interesting dilemma here. The new forestry that we hear about coming out of Oregon, by according to the ecologists down there that I heard a report recently, will probably result in about a 20, in some cases as much as 25% reduction in harvestable yields. Not because it's damaged the site, in fact it's probably protected the site, but because in instituting the new forestry practices you may have to forego 20 to 25% of your harvestable logs. Now a lot of people feel that the new forestry is highly desirable because it protects the environment, etc. But on the one hand, we will condemn a practice that loses 20 to 25 percent harvestable yield when it's done by poor forest, inappropriate forest management, but we're prepared to accept it when it's done in, in the name not of, well, protecting the environment, but in the name of a silvicultural, a particular silvicultural system. And as a society, we have to struggle with that. If we don't like a 25% loss for one reason, uh, do we accept a 25% loss for another reason? Well, you may, because that 25% loss for the second reason may give you other values you want. But you certainly have to think about the question. So here, the whole tree harvesting on these poor sites is inappropriate. Most of the harvesting I've seen in southeastern British Columbia in the last six weeks is whole tree harvesting. 
and some of it has been done because the public has complained about waste. Now, a log on a clear cut is a packed lunch for earthworms 20 years from now. It's part of the system, it's part of the soil biology, it's part of the humus, the renewal of the humus of the soil. People going out to a logging site and seeing a lot of logs there, they say that's waste. In terms, if that log is harvestable and you can saw it up and sell it, in economic terms that's waste. In social terms it's waste because we lose jobs. But biologically it's not waste. Ecologically it's not waste, it's part of the system. So as we look at clear cutting or other harvest methods, we must not confuse our social perceptions and our visual perceptions with the ecological function. And I'm very concerned that in some cases public pressure about waste is leading to clean harvesting that I think is ecologically very detrimental for long-term site productivity. And I agree with a lot of the precepts of new forestry about retaining woody debris on a site. Some ecosystems in BC have too much woody debris. It causes stagnation in growth and productivity. But a lot of our sites need retention of woody debris. Also, sometimes public concern about, clear cut, about slash burning has led to whole tree harvesting as an alternative. And if we, compare, if we compare whole tree harvesting with the old wiener roasting late summer slash burning, the very hot slash burning, whole tree harvesting is probably less damaging. But if we talk about the kind of light spring burning for silver cultural purposes that is done nowadays, in many, many cases, that is much less detrimental to the environment than whole tree harvesting on poor soils. So again, we have to struggle with which is the least negative thing to do. So to start to bring, bring this long presentation to a conclusion, one of the conflicts I think we face in uh, forest management and public attitudes and public thoughts is because different people are thinking on different time scales. Now ecosystems, again, I grew up with Eartha Kitt. A lot of people over here don't seem to know who Eartha Kitt is. She was a very sexy singer and she used to talk about these gentlemen and she always used to talk about Englishmen take their time. Well, nature's like that. Nature recovers slowly from disturbance. Nature's timescales, ecological timescales of recovery from natural disturbance range from centuries to millennia. Nature doesn't care how long it takes, that just nature does it the way nature does it. Management timescales, we don't accept that. Forest managers, resource managers require or expect their forests to recover significantly in decades and hopefully rather completely in many cases within about a century. Anything other than that is probably inappropriate forest resource management. But many people, particularly people with gray beards like myself or senior citizens, we don't have 50 years like some young people have for an ecosystem to recover. If it hasn't recovered in a shorter time period, for us it's forever. So we have to think about timescales, nature's timescales of recovery, management timescales, and social timescales, and somehow struggle with resolving these differences. Something which may not satisfy a social timescale may be completely um, sustainable and maybe well within the range that nature itself would recover from disturbance. So here we have ecological condition, here's a harvest, we've disturbed it. Nature tends to take these kinds of timescales. Forest management strives for these timescales, but many people want things to get better in this timescale.